When I say the other day, I could be referring to any time between yesterday and 15 years ago. I love this one. Next one. I run like the winded. <laughs> when you do squats, are your knees supposed to sound like a goat chewing on an aluminum can stuffed with celery? That's me. <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt people. I just randomly remember things and I get really excited. (laughs) None of you got that. I always say, when you get older, everything hurts and what don't hurt don't work. You've heard that before, haven't you? Because everybody says, I haven't heard that, so fine. I love these little things. My My young grandson called the other day to wish me happy birthday. He asked me how old I was, and I told him, 72. My grandson was quiet for a moment, then he asked, did you start at one? (laughs) After putting her grandchildren to bed, a grandmother changed into old slacks and a droopy blouse and proceeded to wash her hair. As she heard the children getting more and more rambunctious, her patience grew thin. Finally, she threw a towel around her head and stormed into the room, putting them back to bed with a stern warning. As she left the room, she heard three, her three-year-old say with a trembling voice, Who is that? <laughs> You've probably never seen your mom with a towel wrapped around her head. I didn't know if my granddaughter had turned or learned her colors yet, so I decided to test her. I would point out, the, uh, out something and ask, What color is, what? is that? She would tell me, and she was always correct. It was fun for me, so I continued, and at last she headed for the door saying, Grandma, I really think you should try to figure out some of those colors yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, My grandson asked me how old I was. I teasingly replied, I'm not sure. So he said, look in your underwear, Grandpa. It says in mine, four to six. You guys are all together too. By the way, we have the fan off so you can sweat and then also it doesn't mess up the, the uh, voice on the phone here so it can get the message across. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, help me. Judges 2.10 says this. After that, the whole generation had been gathered together to their ancestors. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Basically what that scripture is saying is after some of the great patriarchs had passed away, another generation rose up that did not know God and did not know the things which he did. Psalm 71. Now here's the thing, folks. I was looking this up. A generation was lost. One generation lost because the previous generation did not do everything they were supposed to do. We are seeing that right now in America. We're seeing it in a grotesque fashion that we have a whole generation does not know the Lord and does not know any of the things that he's done. The key thing is they did not know God. You know, one of the scriptures I'll read in a little bit here has to do with the testimony, the uh, Sharing testimonies. I remember sitting with one of my grandkids and I was talking about the miracles of Jesus. Now you understand my kids are believers, but they also have kids that are in uh, public schools. And so I'm telling the story about, I don't know if it was Daniel and the lion's den or the three Hebrew boys, but something that we know so well. And also I threw in some miracles that Jesus did. And this little sweet little face looked up at me and said, oh, Grandpa, with disbelief. That didn't really happen. Well, yes, it did. Already that little child, as a result of being two things, one is being in a place where there's a constant barrage of things that go against what God's word says. And so we have a generation being raised by those in a public school setting that disqualify or just uh, reject anything that has to do with God or the miracle nature of God. It's frightening to me to think that we have people, in fact, if I were to do this right now, 
and I'm not doing it right now, but I'm just going to say, if I were doing that, I wonder if I said, how many of you could stand right now and give a testimony of a current thing God's doing? How many people would be able to jump up and say, that would be me? Now, don't anybody raise your hand. Don't anybody bug me. I'm just saying, if I were to do that, and I'm not, but I want you to know something. There's something missing when we can't stand at any point or where there's such a, a revelation of what God's doing in our life, some fresh thing he's doing that we wouldn't be chomping at the bit to stand up and say, hey, this happened to me this week. This happened to me today or the de- day before. I'm going to go right to a couple of scriptures. These scriptures I'm reading are a, a bunch of them, but I want to make my points through those scriptures to know, and it's, like I say, it's going to be more of an exhortation on uh, on things that God stirred in my heart. Because I had all my notes already. Some of the ten best notes you'll ever find. I had no peace because the Lord is stirring my heart to say, listen, you need to speak from your heart right now because something's missing today in the body of Christ, even among leaders. And I've been guilty of it myself. We're, we're so concerned and, and so concentrated on what's not happening that we don't see that God is still happening and that he's not given up. His church, and he's not given up on the United States of America. He's not given up on the world. He is still God, and there needs to be something again that stirs our heart to be thankful for the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm through apologizing for believing in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the speaking of tongues and the power of God happening in lives. We have pushed that aside because some unpopular idea that somehow is all about our flesh. And I'm sorry, now I got myself all worked up. Sorry. But you know what? In the early days of Pentecost, in our own movement, they said that when Amy McPherson was preaching, or praying rather, with some people for the Holy Spirit to fall, when it happened, you could hear the cries down the street of people saying, Oh, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. We have forgotten that this Holy Spirit who was sent by the Lord Jesus, the promise of the Father, that when he comes, he will give us hope. And it's not about, how, can we make it till the end? But, oh, the comforter has come. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is come. And when we don't have that sense in our heart that the Holy Spirit of God is there, then we lose that comfort. We lose the understanding that we are not here on our own. That we are only going to make it in this life and in this end time because we're full of the Holy Spirit and full of power. Amen. Now that's a lot of jumping around for me. I've got my quota in so far. Are you with me? You know, I haven't raised my voice that in a long time, so I de- definitely feel like I run with the winded. But I'm telling you, something stirring in my, my spirit today. I don't want another generation. Because listen, as I'm getting older, I ask this question. What excuse do, have we offered for the coming generation that says that they don't have to follow or pursue something of God's calling upon their lives? God is invading every area of our present world. But the church is, so, is suffering greatly with people who are feeling the call of God to step up and call or answer the call to be preachers of the gospel. Not only in the workplace, but who will take the place in the pulpits today who have the power of God surging in their very being because they know Jesus, because they know God, and they walk in, in uh, fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Psalm 71, verses 9 through 18 from the New International Version, and this is a little note I want to make. Number one, I am totally settled in my convictions about what the scripture says and about what the word says. Now here's my little prayer. Do not cast me away, Lord, when I'm old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. You saw the extent of my strength a moment ago. And you know, as I was praying this week and as I was sitting there worshiping, I said, Lord, you know, the flesh profits nothing, but the spirit brings life. And I said, Holy Ghost of God, please, Let the empowerment of what happens in this service and in every service coming that will be a manifestation of the presence and the glory of God. Don't cast me away when I'm old, when my strength is gone. You know, I still have some strength. My my knees disagree because I, I do have some weak knees. 
And it's from lifting sheetrock, not from being courageous. My enemies speak against me. The enemy himself, Satan, would try. Oh, thank you. The enemy would try very much to, uh, <clears throat> to tell me it's all over. And by the way, folks, it's not over till Jesus says. Yes. Do not cast me away. The enemy will speak to you and to me, and especially of those that are older right now, that says your day is over. I think back of the younger years of when uh, my first churches, every church, this is the smallest church I've ever pastored in my, my life. And, if, and I, I, I know there are all kinds of cultural things that, that say this is why it's happening. But I still think it's an a, 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 a awful excuse to suggest that somehow the winds of culture would somehow blow out the, the power and the breath of the Holy Spirit in this time. I believe the Spirit of God's breath is breathing upon us and we can have a greater outpouring if we'll just allow the Lord to do it in us. Amen. Our enemy says, God's forsaken me. I've, I've had it. Listen, look at me. I'm telling you, I've had the enemy tell me, you have done, you're done. You've lost it. You don't have young people. You don't have, look at the crowd of people you have. You have a handful of people. And I've heard that lie in my ear. And by the way, I said, well, it's a fact. Well, listen, facts do not always represent the truth. And I'm telling you that the days ahead, I cannot settle for just a mediocre, mediocre ministry that we must as a church rise up in new Holy Spirit power and get once again connected with the Spirit of God to believe for the supernatural, to believe for God to step in and do some things that we did not expect. Amen. Help us, Lord. The psalmist says, Do not be far from me, my God. Come quickly, God. Help me. Verse 13. My accusers perish in shame. May they perish in shame. And those that want to harm me. And I'm talking about the enemy and his outfit. And by the way, anybody who partners with him is in trouble. Don't come against the man of God. Oh, pastor, who do you think you are? I'll tell you exactly who I know I am. According to Scripture, I am a man of God. He is my Lord. He is my God. And in Him do I trust. Verse 14 of that same psalm says, As for me, I will always have hope. I will always have hope. I will praise you, Lord, more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds and your saving acts all day long. You see, folks, the testimony that we bring must be declared continually so the generation that has been lost will be reclaimed and the one after them as well. And the scripture says the same. <clears throat> all your saving acts I'll praise all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. In other words, there's so many I can't recount all of them. There's more than I can ever remember. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds and yours alone. Get this, your deeds, not my deeds, your deeds, Lord, not my own. Since my youth, God, you have taught me. And to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. Holy Spirit, help us. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my Lord. You know, it's a tragedy these days. Is there, tend to, there tends to be a younger generation that forsakes the older And the reason for it is there's been a dissolving of the family unit where people no longer recognize grandpa and grandma or maybe they recognize they have two or three sets because of the dissolve of the family. There's such a, a blatant disrespect for what God has done in those in bygone days. The Bible says the glory of the youth is strength. The glory of an older person is their gray hair. Got a lot of glory on my head, just so you notice. But listen to this. This is my prayer. I will declare your power to the next generation. In other words, do not forsake me, Lord, until I can declare your power to the next generation and your mighty acts to all who are to come. This is a prayer of mine. This is a commitment that I believe God has made to me and I have committed to him to show God's power, not mine, but God's power to the next generation. I started to say this a moment ago. If you remember the days of your youth, how God did so many mighty things when we were young. And I have to look back and say, God, how could you even bless? the? There was so much ignorance. I was so young, but just 
You know what, you know what put me out of my, my uh, junior year of college to go into the field was a passion in my heart that I needed to preach this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ before it was too late because I was so aware in my young age, I was a sophomore at 17 at Bible college, but my passion for Christ so burned with me. I said, what happens if Jesus comes and I'm sitting in this, off, or in this, this uh, classroom? By the way, it was not a wise idea to throw it aside, but the one thing I do stand, uh, the, the education part, the one thing I do stand for is the fact that the passion that Jesus put within me was real enough to where I felt that I must be out doing the Father's business. And so we launched a evangelistic campaigns as young kids who hardly knew what we were doing. And I've told you the testimony of what happened in our high school when just a handful of people got together to pray for an outpouring of the Spirit. We had no agenda except that we wanted God. <coughs> we wanted God more than we wanted anything else. We wanted to know the glory and the presence of the Lord. And we believed that a handful of kids could see it happen. And that little prayer group started with just two or three of us. And then pretty soon we had six or seven. And then pretty soon we had a dozen or more. And then pretty soon a revival broke out with high school students in a school where they had to cancel classes at the high school and the junior high because the move of God was that powerful. And by the way, we're not talking about a school that had a thousand people in it. We're talking about a small Christian school that was full of more atheists and God haters than you'd find any place else. But that young group of prayer warriors would pray. And I remember we'd stand in a circle. We'd put our lunches aside so we wouldn't waste time eating while we prayed that God would come with awesome power. And we hungered to see the move of God. We had such faith then. <coughs> We had such faith. In fact, we had a gal, her name was Maggie. She weighed, Maggie was five foot tall, five foot wide. She was very, very obese. But she was a wonderful, wonderful person. And she wanted so bad to lose weight. And we said, you know, we're gonna go to this healing meeting downtown in Los Angeles with Reverend Evangelist Bob McElroy. He's gonna be praying for people and we're gonna go down there and God's gonna heal you and cause your weight to go away. <laughs> No, you look at pious people. Oh, that was so foolish. Let me tell you, I would rather be foolish for what we did. We got in the car and they brought a change of clothes for Maggie. And we went down to that little meeting. And we believed that somehow by being in the presence of God, all that fat would melt away and she would be thin. We'd have to put clothes on her. I know I've heard people mock that and say, well, you're just stupid. I'll tell you what, I take stupid faith over no faith at all. She didn't lose all the weight. But I tell you what, we went with such faith and expectancy. And I want to tell you something. I don't feel the least bit ashamed that I and that crew of kids that went down there, that we foolishly put God to the test. No, you know what? God put us to the test because he put something in us in our heart that said, you know what? You can believe God for a miracle. And even though maybe God, you know, I don't know, maybe God did that somewhere that I don't know of. But all I know is this, that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So I remember our early days of great faith and passion for Jesus. Verse 20 of that same psalm says, you've allowed me. Now, listen, I, I'm old, but I tell you, with that oldness, here's what happened. You, Lord, have allowed me to suffer much hardship. I tell you what, you can't talk faith until you've been through times when your faith has been challenged. Everybody just, you know, you sailing on, uh, you know, uh, uncharted waters or stormy seas and you didn't have a test in your life. I tell you right now, the worse your trial was, the more God's equipped you to realize that God will meet you at any point in your life. And we've all gone through things in recent history as well as our past where our lives were really put to the test. And somehow we did not bow our head and bow out of our faith, but we stood strong because we knew that our God is real. And even though we were knocked down, we were not destroyed. You will restore me, the psalmist says, to life again. And you'll lift me up from the depths of the earth. And you will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. Then I will praise you <coughs> on the harp because your faithfulness your, uh, to your promises. And I will sing praises to you, O Lord, with the guitar. I added that in. 
Now, there's another generation coming up. Dear ones, I'm going to tell you something. The church needs to wake up today. Because a lot of people have no idea what's happening in our country right now. No idea. We're so busy making money. We're so busy. And some of you go, well, I don't make that much money. You, you got a job, you know. But we're so busy living our lives that we don't realize that right now, the foundation of our nation is being eroded. And if the church doesn't wake up to its calling and its authority and, and the promise of the Holy Ghost falling upon the church in power in these last days, if we don't get on with that program, folks, something is going to happen and it will fall at our feet. Because already there are things going on. And if you, listen, I know <clears throat> some of you don't watch the news and I don't blame you. It's depressing and it'll make you mad and make you walk in the flesh. But if you listen to it correctly, you will hear the Spirit of God cry out in your heart for a revival to turn things around in our country. Right. right now, folks, there are things getting ready to happen that will absolutely destroy our country as we know it. And you know what? The voices that are making all those changes that are trying to destroy our world are not met with an equal voice of authority and passion from the people of God, whether it's from the pulpit or whether it's from the pew or whether it's in the job or marketplace or whatever. There has to be a stirring in a heart <clears throat> not to be some obnoxious, obnoxious person seeking to start a fight, but people who stand up for their faith and realize that look at our world. We don't need another commentary, but to show <clears throat> that right now, our world is in trouble. But God is not. I slobbered all over myself. Pardon me. God is not in trouble. We are. And we need to get back to the one who can save this nation. And to save this world. Is anybody hearing my voice today? Yes. And hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit? Yes. I want to jump over to Psalm 78. <clears throat> Psalm 78 says, My people hear my teaching. Now, I'm taking the, the authority of the psalmist and authority of the word to speak to you this morning, this message that burns in my heart. I'm going to open my mouth with a parable. I will utter things from the old. Things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. You know, I thank God for the testimonies I heard and saw as a young person. As a young person, I saw the testimony of God moving among ignorant young people who were hungry for God. I heard testimonies from my family about the glory of God falling on a little church in the south where the fire department was called because they saw fire on the roof of the church. And it turned out not to be real fire in the sense of blaze, but a sense of, it was actually the glory of the Lord that descended. That happened during the awakening of the Holy Spirit during the, the uh, revival in, uh, uh, I keep forgetting the name of the, Azusa Street. Thank you. Zeus Street. People, God, people were so hungry for God. And somehow we've displaced that hunger for God for, for hopes of some kind of more pure doctrine. And I'll tell you what's re re happened. There are, we're too fussy about how pure our doctrine is instead of how amazing our God is and to preach under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, to speak and live under the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that the conviction that people have will not be because of the energy of our flesh, but because of the witness of God in our life, through our lives, so that people see Jesus. And by the way, he has no other plan but to use you. With all your faults and failures and mine. By the way, this week I met my flesh in the most horrible way. I'll testify about this some other time. It'll mess up my sermon. <laughs> Have you met your ego lately? That'll line us up for the next series on grace. But listen, folks. I'm thankful for the testimony. I remember in, when we were, first went to California, my folks were, mo were both working jobs that didn't pay much. They were uh, in Bible college. <clears throat> uh, we didn't have much money, and it, there were times when we first moved there that we didn't have food, period. We did not have food. We went to a little church in Glendale, Foursquare Church, and someone heard about it. We didn't brag about it. We just, you know, somehow they heard about it and said, Look, we're going to give the Albrechts a, a grocery shower. 
So a knock came to the door, and this was just before Thanksgiving, and I remember going to the door, and there were people standing there with boxes and sacks of groceries. They said, just the Lord put it on heart to bring this stuff to you. As a kid, and my sister remembers this, my brothers remember this, we stood back while they brought in so many groceries, we filled every cupboard and every place in the refrigerator we could. Our closets were from the floor to the ceiling stacked with non-perishable groceries. I'm a little kid. I'm f- at that time, I was 14. And I'm watching this happen. I'm going, our God is faithful. And the testimony of that has stood the test of time because I saw it with my eyes. Now, I've heard testimony of people telling about mighty things God has done. <clears throat> Wendy's uncle was a missionary in Brazil. And he would tell these testimonies of how when they were in Brazil praying for people and preaching the gospel in Sao Paulo. How the anointing of God fell. But before it happened, the evangelist was in a little village and he said, Lord, I've been here a month or two and where's the revival you promised? I'm here. Where is your revival? And the Lord said, look over in the corner. There's a little lady there that's blind. That's your revival. So he went over and prayed for her. She was instantly healed. And that village was shaken from that day forward with people coming to meet Jesus Christ, the healer. The revivals moved to downtown Sao Paulo, and they had so many people gathered in the streets there. They had the the police on horseback to try to keep crowd control. People would come in that were demonized from the insane asylums, and they were prayed for. And they would fall to the ground under the power of the Spirit of God, and their chains were broken because of the anointing of God. The doctors would come in and unhitch the chains that they were bound with because they were violently demonic possessed. And they would be totally healed. He he was going to the meeting one night and as he walked by an alley, he saw a person who was laying in the alley, was begging, but they had leprosy, or uh, not leprosy, but uh, elephantitis in the leg, horrible. Swelling up, full of matter, it was nasty. And the Lord called him to just go over and pray for the person. And so he put his hands on that leg. And as he pulled down on that leg and prayed in the name of Jesus, the matter flowed out. He wiped it off on his hands and prayed. The guy was totally healed. And they went back to that meeting that night. And an officer who had heard, a policeman who had heard about that, brought a little boy on a pallet and brought him up to the stage and said, are you the healer from America? He said, no, but I am the evangelist from America talking about the healer. This little boy needs healing. A little leprous boy. No no nose. uh, uh, Members eaten off because when you have this form of leprosy, you lose all feeling. As he prayed for him, that little boy's nose grew back and little nubs grew back fingers. And I know people said, well, I don't believe that. You weren't there. But you you will throw aside the fact that Jesus Christ who healed the lepers, who cast out demons... Who caused the the lame to walk and the blind to see. This same Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, Holy Ghost, come again and revive your church. We cannot hide these testimonies. You may, listen, I know there's such an unbelief today, even in the church, that you tell these things, they just want, someone wants to, you know, prove it. You know, miracles don't have to be proved. They have to be celebrated and praised over. And let God be God, and let God be true, and every man a liar. That he's still the God who does these things. He commanded us, verse 8, that we should teach our children, so that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children and that they would put their trust in God and would not forget his mighty works. You see, telling the testimony of Jesus can have two effects, either that of unbelief or it will stir the heart to say, I want more of the manifestation of God's glory and God's power. We're not talking about some man putting on a show or show. The power and the glory that God wants to show is about his strength, about his faithfulness, about his power, not ours. We have all seen these flawed leaders over the years who God used and said, well, how can he use that flawed leader? I'll tell you how. Because God will honor his word above anything else that we do that's no excuse for sloppy living but it tells you this god will honor the covenant of his promise where people will preach the word and act in faith upon what god said he would do 
Quit worrying about the person who may be flawed. I tell you this. God has his day to bring judgment to those who are misrepresenting Jesus. But I tell you something, folks, to represent Jesus correctly is to go back to the Bible and read those gospels. They're not just fables. They are truth of what God did. And he's still doing those things today. And we must remember that we have to tell our children so they will grow up knowing that the God their mom and daddy serve is a real God. And that what he does still does today, that he still does those things today. And here's the exhortation that David, or the, the, the psalmist said. We declare these truths for this reason. That the generation come, coming up would not be like their ancestors, stubborn and rebellious. A stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts are not loyal to God, whose spirits are not faithful to him. What happened as a result of that? It says the men of Ephraim, Ephraim I'm sorry, though armed with bows and, and, and armed for battle, by the way, they turned back in the day of battle because they did not keep the covenant of God's law. They refused to live by it. And the key verse here is verse 11. They forgot what he had done and the wonders that he had shown them. You see, lack of courage due to lack of faith is because there are no current testimonies of God's presence working at this time. Help us, Lord Jesus. I'm declaring this great word of God this morning from Jeremiah 32. Oh, sovereign God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to a thousand, but bring punishment to the parents' sins into the laps of their children. Boy, that's a hard one to get a hold of. You know what that says? God is willing to move, but there are consequences for us not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Great are your purposes, mighty God. Great and mighty God are you, whose name is Almighty. Great and mighty are your deeds, verse 19. Your eyes are open to all of the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct and as their de- deeds deserve. But I want to tell you something. I started a couple weeks ago, this little snippet, I'll throw it in here. There's so much out there of disbelief in this goofy idea that somehow, listen folks, we need to be good stewards of our planet. Amen. But I do not buy, and if I, this makes me unpopular, so stinking What? I believe the God who spoke this world into existence will keep it until the day he says, now it's over. And not until. And here's the proof of it. Your word, Lord, is eternal, established in the heavens forever. Your faithfulness continues to all generations. And you established this earth and it will stand. Second Peter chapter 3 says... That the present world, the once world, once a world was destroyed by a flood. This present world is being preserved or kept by God's own word until the time when he says, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. This place is not going down till the Lord God Almighty says, that's it. Amen. And this idea that somehow it is just futile foolishness for mankind to say that we can save a planet God created. Since when did we become God? Help us, God, to realize we are mere men and that the God we serve is mighty enough to hold this thing together until the day when he calls us out of this world into his presence. I have absolute confidence in the power of God and the power of the Holy Ghost to rise up in these last days. Listen. I believe the anointing of God is upon me right now to say what I'm saying. And the fruit of it has has to rest on him. I pray that I stir every heart here to realize this is a time to get serious about God. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. But those who are corrupted by flatteries and have gone against the covenant of God, they will be destroyed. That's not God's problem. That's our failure to line up as a nation, as a people, with the authority of Almighty God, the sovereign Lord who made the heavens and the earth by his great power. You say, well, pastor, when are you going to get to the good news? Here it is, Psalm 89.1. God is faithful to all generations. No matter how far the generations we're seeing right now have fallen. No matter how far 
it seems like they're untouchable. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you've never watched a video, epic videos on your TV, if you do, you have to go and get oil and blood and, and cleanse it. But if you don't know what's going on right now in the culture, you don't know what our kids are facing. The most vulgar, sexual perverse junk is going on on the screen. And some of our children are seeing it. And we're not addressing it. And we've stood back saying, well, we have, we have no right to tell people or legislate to people what's right and wrong. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because everything about our laws right now legislates between right and wrong. Even though at this present hour, there is no true legislation of righteousness. And the unrighteous right now rule in so many ways. And the Bible says when the unrighteous rule, the people groan. And people are broken right now because of it. Another promise to this generation, and I declare this right now. 89.4 of Psalms, thy seed will be established forever and can build up thy throne, O Lord, to all generations. In other words, God is still working with the generations. We can see them redeemed. And that generation is to be built up so that the generations in front of them and behind them, especially in front of them, can be rebuilt But here's the promise of Joel chapter 2. Do not be afraid, O people of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Verse 23. Be glad, O people of Zion. That's the people of God. Rejoice in the Lord God. Rejoice because he's given you the autumn rains. And he's faithful and he sends abundant showers. Joel 27, 30. I'm sorry. Joel 2 verses 27 and 30. The outpouring of the Spirit will convince this present generation that the power of God is real as we believe for a manifestation of that. He says this, Then you will know that I am in Israel and that I am. And by the way, that's not I am. I'm in there. It's I am. The great I am. Not the great I was. The great I am is in Israel. He's in God's people right now. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. And he goes on to say, Never again will my people be ashamed. And afterwards... During the time that we're in right now, this is a prophetic promise that Peter reiterated on the day of Pentecost. And so I'm going to say this with all boldness. I will pour out my spirit, the Bible says, on all people, all flesh, not just saved flesh, but lost flesh, completely destroyed flesh, perverted people, whatever the darkest people you can imagine. God loves them. His grace is there for them. And he will open up their eyes and their hearts to receive what needs to happen when we yield to the Holy Spirit and cry out to God that he will pour out his spirit so that, get this, this is the hope for a generation. You've heard it before. Oh, dear Lord, help us to hear it again. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men, thank God, will have dreams. Don't make me come out there. I need a shout every now and then, folks. Dear land, are we a Pentecostal church or did we die on the vine someplace? I know. Don't do it, Pastor. You're going to stir up a bunch of stupid people. Well, you're not stupid. And if you raise your voice and praise God, you're good. The old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see visions. See, the problem right now is our world is running wild because the generation has no vision for the future. They believe that you might as well eat, drink, and be stupid. What do they have to look forward to? Our government has failed. Our legislators have made laws that make things stupid. Listen, I I tell you right now, I'm not political at all. I'm telling you right now, as a man of God, responsible to the word of God, that what's happening in our world, we have to stand up and say that God is coming to a time, it's coming a time that God's going to, Pour out his spirit in one hand, and before it's all over, before it's all over, there will be a billion soul harvest, and then shall the end come. We believe that God is going to pour out his spirit in those days. And he says, at verse 30, I will show you wonders in the heavens and the earth. But here's here's an interesting thing you need to know. Isaiah 40, we know this so well. Even the youth shall faint. And you know, a lot of times youth will faint because the preacher preaches too long. But listen, this is not about us enduring. This is about us understanding the urgency of the hour. And I tell you, if this is the last sermon I ever preach, I'm going to say it right from his word. 
Even the young will be weary and faint. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That word, they that wait, is the word that has to do, I looked it up the Hebrew again, it means to twist tightly like a rope. They that wait upon the Lord, bind themselves to God and to his word. They will renew their strength. And I'm praying that God, as he pours out his spirit upon me, as I look toward that great hope of what he's going to do in this generation, what he's going to do in CCR, as we serve God with a passion, with a hungry heart for the spirit, that as we join ourselves to him with great hope, and forget about the empty chairs and forget about all that's not, but begin to understand that the comforter has come and he's come to make himself known and to make Jesus known in a way that we will manifest his glory in such a way that, that the world will see that we believe it. You see, the scripture says in Isaiah 29, because this people draw near to me with their mouths and their lips do honor me, but they've removed their heart from me and the fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to, do, proceed to do a marvelous work and a wonder among this people. Even a wonder, a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudence shall be hid. Listen, what's getting ready to happen is that all these things that look so smart to our, a die, dead and dying world, a world that's living in spiritual blindness, suddenly, and dear ones, hear me, suddenly those that are in power are going to experience the work of God in such a way is that they will be seen for what they are, fumbling liars who are leading people down a path that will destroy them. They don't care about our country. And you say, Pastor, are you being political? I'm talking about any person who's perpetrating evil. I don't care what your stripe is. I don't care what your politics are. Right now, the church needs to awaken to the strength of God and stop being this this. Waste of space that just wants to keep everybody happy with everything we do. We will stir up the devils when we start standing up for what God says needs to happen in this hour. Right. Holy Spirit. God promised Israel he was going to bring them out of bondage. Moses returned to the Lord. You remember what happened. God said, I'm going to deliver you. And the, the Pharaoh made it even difficult. Now they have to make bricks and gather straw. And Moses is ticked. He goes, God, listen. Why have you entreated us with such evil? Why is it that you have sent me to say this? Things are only getting worse. For since I came to Pharaoh, this is verse 23 of Exodus 5. Since I came to Pharaoh to speak thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered us at all. Then he comes back, and I love this, Exodus 6, 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now shall you see what I will do to Pharaoh. With a strong hand shall I let them go, and with a strong hand shall he deliver and drive them out of this land, drive out those inhabitants of the land. Now, I'm done, except for one thing. And that is, we've not done this in a long time. So I want some music to play. Not because God can't move without it. But I want you to be more conscious of God than you are anything else. We have not done this in a long time. And then I'm going to ask you to take a stand today. In fact, I'd like you to stand right now. Because I don't think that we can do proper uh, allegiance to this message today. Unless we do something that's an act, a prophetic act of faith. And I'm going to ask you this morning, if the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, that you'll make your way to the front here around this altar. As people are saying, I am here to seek the fullness of God. I want more of God in my life. If God has stirred your heart, and listen, I'm telling you right now, there's no doubt in my mind that this word was from the Holy Spirit. I know it's from him. And if we will just obey and let God lead, I'm going to ask you to come and come and stand around this altar. I want you to come. So I, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for every single person. And I want to pray that God will 